Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad to be here. We're going to be talking about putting a genie back in a bottle. I'm sure you've all heard of genies. They're a special mythical creature that can grant you wishes, but they're tricksters. They also cost something, these wishes. And the one we're going to be talking about today is called global warming. Anybody here heard the term global warming before? Yeah. yeah. How about climate change? Okay. Sometimes people use those terms interchangeably. What you see there in the blue line is for many hundreds of years, carbon dioxide was pretty much at one level here on the planet until we had something called the Industrial Revolution. Scientists measure carbon dioxide way back then through ice cores and they find the little particles of air so they know how much carbon dioxide used to be in our atmosphere. But you'll see on the red line, it wiggles a lot because that's temperature. As carbon dioxide was released through industrial processes, uh, the temperature started to go up. This is our genie. This is the trick. Industrial society made what we have today, electricity, cars, uh, heating at your home at night, made all that possible. But this is the price. The temperature is going up. Why is that? It's because of something that's very natural. The sun heats our planet. Some of the heat is reflected back off into space. Some of it bounces off the atmosphere back into uh, our, our Earth. It keeps us right about the right temperature for human beings. Unfortunately, as more CO2, carbon dioxide, is released into the atmosphere, it acts like a greenhouse. It becomes hotter and hotter. And that's why you hear them called greenhouse gases. They come from fossil fuels, oil, gas, uh, and coal. These are plants that lived hundreds of millions of years ago that died and then have been compressed underneath the ground and changed their form. We are literally using the energy from the sun from hundreds of millions of years ago when we use these fossil fuels. They make up about 82% of global warming gases. They're not the only thing, though. Agriculture, other human activities add to that. Agriculture adds about 9%. And we're going to be talking about <clears throat> putting carbon back in the soil through how we grow food. Unfortunately, we are still <clears throat> emitting carbon at more than 100 billion tons per day. So we're headed in the wrong direction. We need to turn around. The good news is we've started to turn around. You'll see on this graph that our use of coal has gone down from the 1970s. Coal is the dirtiest of the greenhouse gas emitters. And we're also beginning to replace it with things like solar and wind, alternative energies that don't release greenhouse gases. Uh, you see here the solar graph. That line that goes almost straight up is called an exponential curve. Um, the wind line would look very much like that. So we're, we're headed in the right direction. But unfortunately, to put this genie back in the bottle, it's going to take more than just getting off fossil fuels. Because if we stopped using fossil fuels today, it wouldn't stop warming, because there's already too much greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Scientists tell us that for safety's sake, we need it to be at no more than 350 parts per million. And right now, we're measuring a little over 400, 412. So we have to figure out how to put some of that carbon back in the ground. Now, one of the ways to do that, you probably, how many people have heard that planting trees is a way to, it is, it's a really good way to put carbon back into the tree trunk, but, you know, it's millions and millions of trees. There's another way to do it, too. It's how we grow food, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, one of the wonderful things about the soil that uh, you, if you walk out from this auditorium today and step off the sidewalk, you are going to be stepping on top of a living ecosystem that is full of critters. More than a billion critters will be underneath your feet, and they're all exchanging nutrients. And a big part of that exchange is carbon. And it includes worms and fungus and molds and bacteria and protozoas. And it's all going on right now underneath our feet. It's an amazing, miraculous thing that helps produce food and 
Sun and plants are a key part of that, as are animals who move the seeds around, eat the fruit. Just like us, we play a role in how this system works. Where, how does it begin? It begins with the plants themselves. They strip the carbon off of the CO2, the carbon dioxide, and they send it down into the root zone. The oxygen they breathe out, and lucky us, we breathe oxygen, so they're supplying oxygen for us to breathe, but they're putting carbon down into the soil for all those critters. And old-fashioned agriculture, before there were fertilizers made out of fossil fuels, used things like crop rotation and uh, cover crops in order to provide the nutrition the plants needed to have healthy crops. We can help that process along by making and adding compost. You make compost with two ingredients, greens and browns. Greens are things like grass trimmings, uh, trimmings from plants, and food scraps, because they have a lot of nitrogen in them. Browns are things like dead leaves, straw, and even things like newspaper or brown paper bags or the cartons that you get eggs in. You layer these in a pile, like in a bin that you see those various students, different kinds of bins, and then you wait for all those critters that are in the soil. They will quickly start a process, very miraculous, and in about three months, you'll get a nice, healthy-looking, dark compost full of nutrients uh, that you just spread on top of the garden. You don't have to dig it in, you just put it on top. All those critters that we talked about are gonna carry them down into the deep root zones. The roots themselves will help carry it down with rain or water. So one of the advantages of compost is that it, put, it makes it easier for the soil to store water. So there's really big advantages of doing compost. Um, here you can see a picture uh, of soil that was treated with compost, that dark black area shows how rich that soil is with carbon. You can see the roots going down through them. Those go many feet deep. A study uh, done over here at UC Davis showed that after 19 years, they found compost six feet underground, and they never dug it in at all. It was just put on top of the ground. So all those natural processes carried it deep down into the soil, putting that genie back in the bottle. It's really important that we, we take those food scraps out of garbage, too, and put them in a compost pile. Because if you don't, and they go into a landfill, they help create methane, a very uh, serious global warming uh, gas, very intense. They do that because when they get crushed in the landfill underneath that heavy material, the decay process is different, and it actually produces methane. You don't have to have a big yard to be uh, a composter and use your compost in a garden. Here's some pictures of different ways to do small gardens. They're called keyhole beds because you don't even, you don't have to do rows because they're tiny and you can reach the plants from anywhere. And you can grow plants very intensively if you're adding compost to the soil. Here's a picture of something that we call a forest garden, um, another word you might run into is regenerative agriculture. This is what you can do when you mimic nature, when you uh, follow nature's models that you see in a forest. You have upper story of trees like fruit trees and nut trees. Below that, you'll have shrubs that produce berries. And um, below that, you can have the plants like herbs for uh, the flavor of your meals or your vegetables. You can even have an annual garden like the regular vegetables we get. My wife and I's and our son's uh, permaculture plot uh, has, it's not quite as attractive as this picture, but it has all these stories. So we get oranges, persimmons, figs, plums. We also get blackberries, two kinds of grapes. We, we grow sorrel, we get asparagus out of the garden. Those come every year. For 20 years, an asparagus plant lives for 20 years. Um, we get chard, we get um, collards, and every summer we grow some corn, some beans, some tomatoes, some squash, and potatoes. So we have a very varied diet. We also have an herb spiral with rosemary, thyme, sage, so all of our meals taste real good. One of the things that you should know is that as a society, back in World War II, there were things called victory gardens, that people were asked to grow food in their own yard. And we did. 
40% of all the food grown during World War II was grown in people's yards. So we can make this happen. It's doable. And let's say you don't have a, a yard for a garden. Um, or, then there are some things you can do too. So we definitely don't want to leave that out. You can eat less meat because meat uh, uses a lot of carbon to produce it. You can walk instead of drive to the store. You can, um, or you can ride your bike. You can uh, thrift store. I know thrift, thrifting is a lot of fun instead of buying new fashion because most new fashion is made with artificial uh, fibers. You can also um, do things like join the group that so Sapri is going to talk to you about uh, later in the, the session today. So there's much that you can do to help put the genie back in the bottle, and I encourage you to uh, look for opportunities for help here in the community, uh, just like all those critters that work together in the soil. There's a community of people that are ready to help you. Here in Sacramento, we have Three Sisters Garden uh, that will help you learn how to do composting and gardening at your school. Um, there's Israel Family Farms in Sacramento that if you're really interested in this and want to become an intern and learn how to do this, they have programs for students. Uh, there is a group called Resoil that takes scraps from restaurants and then distributes them around to people who are willing to compost in the community. And they'll come over from Sacramento and help you set up a system like that here in West Sacramento as well. And the group that I am primarily volunteering with, Sacramento Climate Coalition, we have a website. You can look up lots of different things you can do to help put that genie back in the bottle. Thanks very much for your time today. And I'm looking forward to working with you and everybody to stop climate change.